Thank you, and as, as before, thanks for having me and give this talk. I was very excited to come and talk about, um, well, when I was invited, I was very excited to come and talk about these, some new techniques that we're using in the lab, about the title, about translating, a uh, translational approach for predicting substance, use in youth, uh, substance abuse in youth. And while preparing my talk in the way here, I realized I don't really study substance abuse in youth. <laughs> 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 uh, but we, that's not completely true, of course. We, I'm, I'm heavily involved in studies like the ABCD study and other, other big studies that are uh, examining these types of questions. And I think a lot of the techniques that we've been developing um, over the last several years and approaches that we've been doing are, are gonna be um, useful for understanding and what we're, what's going to be coming out of these new new types of data. I always like to start off by first giving my acknowledgments, just in case I go over, um, because there's really a lot of the work I'll be talking about today it takes an enormous amount of people to conduct, from clinical psychologists to biomedical engineers, um, lots of graduate students and, and postdocs, coordinators, I mean, it's uh, other types of clinicians. It's really, uh, in, um, at a large number of people that's been required to do all this work. All right, so I have four main goals here. One is I'll, I'll briefly go over functional connectivity, MRI, and, and graph theory. These are some of the techniques that we use in the lab. Um, I know it's a mixed crowd here, so I wanna make sure I, that everybody's on the same page. And then I'll kind of spend you know, <coughs> equally sized chunks on, on three areas that we think of, that the lab really thinks is important for studying substance use. And one is we gotta do a better job in forming heterogeneity. We think we can do that with some techniques with graph theory. Another is we, we, we have to start thinking about the, about the developmental origins of some of these problems, you know, not just when we, we first see the issues. Um, and then we have to really do a better job at bridging this information across species so we can translate into active, um, um, actionable items. Okay. So functional connectivity and graph theory. So what is functional connectivity? Well, most people are now familiar with traditional fMRI, right, where you put someone in a scanner, you have them do some type of task and leave by some, by some type of control task, so you have them open their eyes and close their eyes, open their eyes and close their eyes, open their eyes and close their eyes, over and over and over again. Do some type of selective averaging of that signal, and lo and behold, you can see the part of the brain that's active when you're opening versus when you're closing your eyes. Well, one of the questions is, well, why why is it that we have to do this so many times to be able to actually get a signal? And the reason is because the, the data is very noisy, okay? Now, <clears throat> Brett Biswal, back in 1995, decided to look a little more closely at this noise. And what he did is he started off with just a traditional experiment where he had folks in the scanner finger tapping and then rest and finger tapping and rest and then finger tapping and rest over and over and over again. Did selective averaging and lo and behold, the parts of the brain that were active when you're tapping your finger, like the um, like motor cortex and supplementary motor areas, okay? And then what he did is he took the same subjects, put them in the scanner a different time, this time had to do nothing at all, to sit there at rest. He can measure the noise in one of the regions and then correlated that noise with all the rest of the voxels in the brain, and lo and behold, the same parts <laughs> of the brain that were active when you were tapping your finger were also sitting there spontaneously oscillating with each other at rest. And what this told us is that this information that we average out of all of our fMRI experiments is really not noise at all, but actually functionally relevant signals that can tell us about, the, about some of the structure of, and architecture of the, of, the, of the brain. And so this is, in essence, rest and state functional connectivity, and that is the measurement that I'll be talking about a lot today, okay? Now, we've been using this technique in combination with graph theory. We were originally, I was originally um, exposed to this by Olaf Sporns in this, this paper, which is now not quite a classic, about the organization and development of functional complex brain networks. So what is graph theory? Well, graph theory is all about the study of networks. What are networks? <laughs> well, networks are simply collections of nodes. So nodes can be anything from people to cities to web pages, right, that are linked by some line or edge. That would then be friends between people, roads between cities, or links between web pages, okay? Now, graphy has been used to study all different types of systems, from networks on the internet, to U.S. commuting patterns, to interactions of committees and subcommittees 
in Congress, they're particularly active right now, <laughs> um, to um, protein-protein interactions in yeast, right? And what you can see from all these pictures is that the systems aren't regular, right? It's not simply A connects to B, connects to C, connects to D, right? But they're also not random. There's clearly some type of structure in here, okay? And so what graph theory does, it says, well, well how do we quantify these patterns and what do they mean with regard to how the nature or the function of the system? Okay? So there are several metrics that we can use to do that. There are some simple things like degree, which is just the number of edges a given node has. So some nodes have lots of connections, meaning they have high degree, and some nodes have few connections, meaning they have low degree. Okay? There are things like path length. So if I want to get information from this guy over here to this guy over here, I have to go over three jumps. Right, so I, this the path length from here to here is three. If I want to get the path length of a given node, I can I can average the path lengths to all the other nodes. I can get a characteristic path length of the graph by averaging the path length then of all the nodes together. But there are some other measures like this one, which is called communicability, which takes and considers all the different paths between two nodes. Right, so and the communicability is simply the weight and sum of all the paths between two regions, where if I have a direct connection between two regions, I mean, the shorter the path, the more weight it gets, essentially, to the, to the uh, this is the equation, but the point is, is that you can sum up all the paths between two regions when, and weighting them by the number of jumps you need to get between those guys, okay? <coughs> and there are other, some other, a few things like clustering coefficient, I won't go over, I won't go over that, that's, that's important for this talk today, but but this one is in the idea of modules or, net or clusters of nodes that are densely connected with each other. So in a lot, lot of systems, there are clusters of nodes that are densely connected to each other relative to other, other networks, okay? And we have various types of community detection algorithms that allow us to identify if and where these networks might exist. And these algorithms work by trying to maximizing the number of inter-community edges within a given number of systems relative to the inter-community edges, okay? And I'm just <coughs> skip over these parts right now too. Okay, so, um, so in our in graph, in our, um, so in our hands, oop, we're oh. and so uh, can people still hear me? I'll just can speak up loud. So in our hands, we're, um, our nodes are brain regions, and the links, and the links between them are these is the spontaneous activity. Okay, and in our, um, I'd say over the last, maybe not quite ten years, but close to ten years, where these 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 techniques have been applied to um, have been applied to these to brain, we've, we've come a long way. So we now know there's about somewhere between ten and fifteen kind of well orchestrated networks, distributed systems in the brain. Um, some of these have become so universally used in the literature, we forget that they're relatively recently <laughs> identified. You know, things like the frontal parietal systems and these dorsal tension systems. We talked about the executive networks <laughs> of these, that, which includes these anterior singlet and, and this bilateral insula. So these are, this is some of the rec recent regions that come out of this work. And the idea is that these, there's this clustering within these networks that supports segregation and distributed information processing, and that the integration of such systems is accomplished via very, very a few, but very important links. Okay, so um, what, is my, what is my lab in We talked about this as essentially the outline. We study typical and typical brain development, and we think that there's essentially these four pillars that are really kind of need to kind of come together to be able to really, really understand what we're looking at. So we need to do a better job at getting more precise measurements to, so we can measure, look at individual differences. I'm not going to go any, over any of that work today. But if people are interested in what we're doing on that front, you can be, feel free to talk to me. Like I said in the outline, we need to understand population heterogeneity. We need to understand this, where, what factors may be starting these atypical trajectories. And we need to do a better job of translating a lot of the information we can obtain with, in, with our human studies to animal models where we can really understand <laughs> what, what's going on. So I'm going to go over a couple examples of all of these, or at least the last three for you guys here today. So population heterogeneity. So what is the heterogeneity problem? So, so one goal when we're 
examining complex behaviors or brain physiology in youth is determine whether the information directly associates with development trajectories or mental health issues like substance use disorders now or later in life, right? In other words, can the information from these tools at a given developmental stage assist in predicting some future outcome? Can it help us tailor early interventions and future therapeutics to improve health outcomes of a given individual? Okay. Now, typically, including my lab, we usually start this. We usually start this off with this type of model where we define some group by some external factor like the DSM or, you know, or something else, right? Compared to some, can, can compare to some other some other group. My lab studies a lot of ADHD, so we we would do you know just study ADHD versus control. We study development. We could just do a kid versus adult, or you might take a user versus a non-user. Okay. Now, there's a, a, a couple problems with this model. First, it largely relies on the assumption that our diagnostic categories are homogeneous, right? It may be that there's lots of different mechanisms that may lead to the same exact phenotype, right? But the model also presumes that the control population represents one big homogeneous group, right? There may be lots of different types of profiles that exist even in the, in the typical population, right? Now, the idea that heterogeneity in the case of ADHD, substance use disorders, and other mental health disorders exist is not new. There's been lots and lots and lots of theories that have come out on, on this that it must be true, right? But while it's easy to propose conceptually that there must be distinct subgroups within a ment mental disorder or typical population, empirically demonstrating that those subgroups exist is not very straightforward. And here's why. So. If I take my, if I take a, go back, if we go back to our labs right now and we start a new study and we put three people in it, it's pretty easy. There's only two different ways you can subdivide those two people, okay? As soon as you have 10 people in your study, there's now 21,000 different ways you can subdivide those 10 people. As soon as there's 15 people in your study, there's over a billion different ways. As soon as there's 20 people in your study, there's over a trillion different ways that you can subdivide just those 20 people, okay? So computationally, this is like, this is a hard problem. Now there's lots of, of course, techniques that some of you have heard of to try to be able to deal with it. Hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, latent class analyses, finite fixture models, etc. What we've been playing with is trying to use graph theory and specifically community detection to be able to handle this for several reasons. I'm not going to go over the details, but, but I'm, I'll give you some examples. Okay, so in this case, what we're doing now is now instead of our brain regions being our nodes, in our correlations between those guys being the edges, now we have people as our nodes, and we have we have relationships across several patient or um, subject-centered measurements as the edges. Okay, and the idea is, can you identify potential different subgroups in the population? All right. Now, <clears throat> our first stint to this was actually in ADHD. Of course, ADHD is a high risk factor for a lot of the substance use disorders we studied. Um, where we just took a bunch of about 20 different neuropsychological tests and <laughs> did some fe net rational feature reduction using confirmatory factor analysis that gave us these seven domains that it, working <coughs> memory, inhibition, arousal activation, response variability, and so on and so forth. Okay? From all these, from all this relatively large group of samples, which large sampling, about 500 kids. And then we can, we can correlate across all those domains, each subject. Some subjects have are higher, more highly correlated than others, so some they're kind of linked versus not. But on these, kind of, on these matrices, we can apply our community detection algorithm to see if these different types of subgroups exist. So we did this, and we were very excited because if you look across, now these are all these aren't clinical measures, these are all empirical measures, psychometrics, right? If you look at this, we were very excited because we saw essentially four different types of profiles or groups in the ADHD population relative to their peers. We saw one group that seemed to be atypical up, and this graph is bad, atypical in response variability. We saw another group that was atypical in, ex in several executive function, inhibition, working memory. We saw another group that was atypical in temporal information processing, another group that was atypical in arousal. Okay, So that was very exciting. Before, of course, going off and sending our paper to, you know, the New England Journal, we decided to look at the control population, and this is what we saw. <laughs> and what you see here is that a lot of the same profiles that we saw in ADHD that seem to exist in the control population as well. So at first, of course, we thought that I was doing something wrong, but after 
at least a half a year, but probably up to a year after trying to fix the mistake, we, just, we thought, hmm, maybe there's some variability in just the general population altogether, okay? And so <clears throat> we decided to do something where if you, if, you, if you compare across all these different domains in our ADHD population controls, what you can see is that up is, again, as bad as that, just like the literature would suggest, the ADHD is, on average, across everybody is worse than the, than the typically developing control population, okay? But what if you instead try to compare them with their cognitive style or profile? Does, it, does the same pattern still pop out, okay? And the answer is complex, but it's, it's, well, it's actually quite simple in some, case, in some respect. In some kids that you see, indeed, they're atypical across all these domains, okay? But in other kids, they're almost identical to the control population, except for maybe in, in one specific domain, okay? And so what these data are beginning to suggest is that a portion of the variation we observe in, in, in behavior and in connectivity, I'm not going to show you those data, but in typically developing populations embedded in these, these kind of discrete communities. You know, the data also suggests that the heterogeneity in individuals, at least with ADHD, appears to be kind of nested in this normal variation, right? And it may be that identifying a mechanism associated with mental disorder, such as ADHD or substance use, requires compared individuals to well-adjusted persons within the same cognitive style or profile, okay? But the question earlier was, well, can this information from these tools help us predict a future outcome, right? Can it help us tailor early interventions? And so Sarah Kerr Lunas, who at the time was a postdoc, now she's an assistant professor at OHSU, um, very talented, decided to look at, this, look, look at this idea and apply these techniques using uh, a, a measure that can be more readily applied in the clinic called the, temperament, the TMCQ, Temperament Middle Childhood Questionnaire. Many of you are familiar with this which measures uh, several different uh, temperament domains, okay? It's, it's about 440 kids that was examined. I'm just gonna focus on the ADHD population right now, but, but what she found was, was three groups. She found one group she called uncomplicated, another group she called surgeon, another group she called negative emotion. I'll explain why she called it that in a second. Here's a picture of the temperament scales over here and, uh, as a function of the, of the Z scores. And so the, for the uncomplicated group, which is, so first of all, all the groups were atypical in attention and, and inhibition, so in impulsivity, I think that you might expect in this type of population. The uncomplicated group here is in blue, and all the other domains, they're relatively normal, okay? The other two groups <laughs> diverge in a, in, a, in a very specific way, where we have one group over here, that's hard to see, but these guys are, they're low on shyness, these are the high in pleasure seeking, these are the, these are the pleasure seeking kids, you know? The ADHD clinical symptoms, they look identical to all the other kids, but if you've ever talked to a clinician about, the, about this, this kind of subgroup, they're like, I know that kid. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're coming in, they're really excited to go, they're bouncing off the walls, they're just they're, they're going for it, right? Another group, which is going to be the focus here now, is this negative emotion group who was high anxiety, high anger, discomfort, okay? These guys really had really strong negative emotions, but very little of the, of the pleasure-seeking type scales, okay? Now, what's most important, I think, about this is that if we follow these kids up even just one year later, one year, of that negative emotional group, nearly 50% of them went on to have a new onset disorder, okay, relative to, the, relative to the other two groups. So identifying these groups, even though you can't tell them apart based on symptoms or clinical diagnosis alone, was telling us something about the future, we now know that we've now followed these kids up for you know, several years, I think almost four years more now, and the trends just keep continuing going up. Um, they're very, the groups are very stable, but that negative emotion group is like, is, this is, 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 it tells us something at this early time point when we're first getting it. Now, there is a problem. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, well, if, if of all these different subdivisions that we were talking about earlier, right? The all different ways you can subdivide a specific population. Many of these nearly unlimited subpopulations that you might get from a, from a group are totally valid, okay? They're just not really important for the types of questions that we're asking, okay? So, well, what, what do I mean by that? Well, 
So let's take our, 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 the inauguration ceremonies of our recent presidents, right? I can probably take all these people, right, and I can, I gave this, I gave this talk, a part of this talk in Texas about a month ago, which is why. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you might, you might imagine from this group of people, I might take a bunch of features like height, skin color, hair color, eye color, right? I can put them into my, I can put them in my algorithm. I can probably subdivide the populations based on, it's not even perfect, but do a reasonably good job on some type of measure on cultural background. And it's totally, going to be totally valid. And it's going to be reasonable, okay? Or I could take a different, a different set of features like cable news channels watched or websites visited, right? And I probably could, you know, make a line right down the middle of here about folks' political leanings, right? But if my question was, who in these crowds is going to have a baby in the next 10 years, right? Then those groups are gonna be, even though they're valid, are gonna be not very informative, right? I probably need to include some other features like age and gender to be able to get a relatively good prediction about that particular question, okay? So the point is, is that, is that if our ideas regarding hydrogen are correct, there's likely going to be different clusters or different distributions depending on the questions or outcome we're interested in. And so that's a, a, a thing we've been thinking about quite heavily. Um, I don't get to go into this in deeply because I want to get to the other pieces, but, but what we've been doing is combining this technique of graph theory with machine learning to be able to, to identify types of subpopulations that are specific to the types of questions that you're interested in. Um, this is just a, a quick example, and we've done this in autism where you can identify different subpopulations based on behavior. Um, in the autistic group, they have different the changes in brain. We're not gonna go over the details, but if folks are interested in the, in the specifics about the method, because it is a little bit complex, I'd be happy to go over that with folks. Okay, so the point here is that community detection, and combined with machine learning that I didn't go over, but might serve as a way to characterize heterogeneity in samples that targets an outcome of interest. It's actively, we're, you know, actively examining whether a similar approach might be well suited to study questions of interest in adolescent development, including substance use disorders, is something that the lab is, is, is very actively doing. Okay, so the other part here, the other piece here is developmental origins that we think is really important for the types of questions that we're asking, okay? The, the thing is, when do the, these atypical trajectories begin? What are some factors that might in, increase the risk for it, okay? Where do we start? Well, here's just a, a quick picture of timeline of life that starts at conception and ends at approximately age 60, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but we're, most of the work that we do when we study development is in this, in this realm right here, is between these two lines, between five and 18 or so forth, right? Where, you know, there's still a lot of developmental processes going on, but the chunk of the major stuff has, been, has, has happened well before, okay? Neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, my, you know, neural migration, cell death, all this stuff has happened like way, 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 way back, okay? So we think that identifying early prenatal influences on early brain development may max, actually maximize some opportunities for prevention. One of the questions is, yeah, it seems obvious, well, why haven't we done this more work in this realm? And the answer is, it's pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just super challenging to link, to actually collect the data and then to, <coughs> to link these different stages of development, partly, partly, of course, because of our protracted um, period of development. But I'm lucky in that we have, I have several collaborators that are really good at this. Um, Claudia Buss and Path of Wadawa at the University, uh, University of California, Irvine, and Alice Graham, who's uh, a postdoc on her way to becoming uh, assistant professor at OHSU, is, um, are really, really good at answering this question. This is the basic model, right, where you have, we think that the, there's environment in, that are interacting with the maternal, pletos, maternal placido um, biological state that affects fetal brain and, and eventually newborn, and newborn brain and long-term trajectories, okay? that we think may lead to various types of psychiatric disorders and may relate to some of the stuff that we're studying now way later, okay? I'm gonna give you one example of where we think that we've may maybe made some progress here, um, but we have other examples here as well. So this is just a sample of, of 
of, it's actually now about 100 healthy moms and infant dyads, um, where we measure all different types of information during, during pregnancy at three, at three different stages, at the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. And we get brain scans at birth, and we've now we're following these kids for, for several years, okay? Um, now, the first, this, this example I'm going to show you is studying Im the immune response in moms during pregnancy. And specifically, we're using IL-6 as a marker of, of increased or decreased inflammation in moms. These are just typical um, populations. There's no, no, no risk population. Now, inflammation poses risk for various psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, autism, ADHD. A few of these are very highly related to substance use disorders, right? And these types of associations have been shown through studies of infection, high psychosocial stress, and things like high body mass index. In fact, if you look at our sample, and you look at the pre-pregnancy BMI and relative to their, their mean IL-6 measurements across all of pregnancy, it is extremely tightly related. So our diet has a big effect on, on these maternal, this maternal state, okay? Now the first thing is you want to try to think, well, within this context, one question is whether this maternal inflammation relates to brain organization when you're first born, right? You know, if we have IL-6 and you have increased immune responses during pregnancy, does that affect brain, okay? So we did this, looked at this using a, what's called a partial least squares regression. It's a machine learning technique. I'm not gonna go into details, but essentially we have our, our connectivity. We can generate a connectivity matrix for all of our participants. This matrix is divided into our, our specific networks. That's what the colors are here. Okay, and we can take either either sections of all the connections within a network or between networks. Okay, reorganize them into vectors essentially for each subject, and then we say, you know, then we, with a cross validation technique, we say, well, can we actually, based on the newborn brain, can we actually estimate backwards to what the IL six levels were in mom during pregnancy? Okay. We can do that, we, we can we do it across validation, we should do it many times, we can get a, a true distribution versus a, a, we can generate a, a null model, so a null distribution. So if we can see differences between the two distributions, we know that indeed for this particular set of connections that we can, in, we can indeed estimate maternal, maternal inflammation, okay? So here's a picture, I mean here's a, a graph of all the different within and between networks, so Here's all this would be within the network default network connections here, default to default, and this would be within visual, within single percolar. So this all here along this diagonal within network connections, and anything in here is between network. Okay. So here's just an ex here's just an example of of the subcortical structure to the dorsal tension system seems to be predictive of this maternal IL six. Okay. There's other within networks that, were, that are less strong. So this is the salience network, the executive function network that was discussed in the last talk, um, which is also, the, you can see that the, the effect size is much lower, but it's, it is significantly predicted. But of course, there's other, lots of other places. Okay, now, to make a long story short, I'm gonna reduce this information down to something that we're used to by, by essentially transforming this into a picture of all the nodes in the brain that were most, based on the beta weights of the model, that are most strongly related to predicting IL-6 during pregnancy, okay? And that's this picture right here, okay? So what you can see from this picture is that there's lots of, lots of, lots of brain regions that were really highly predictive, and other ones where the, where the balls are, we call these tumor brains, where they're a little, <laughs> a little smaller or less predictive, okay? And what you can see are these guys are subcortical, this is cerebellum, singular percolar executive network, and dorsal tension system. Okay, and some frontal parietal stuff here too. Now what you can see from this picture, right, is that it kind of maps on a lot of these executive function networks that we've, that we've are been grown to love, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that measure all different types of executive things from working memory, sustained attention, internment, planning, things like that, okay? So first what we have is we have that, we, have, we can estimate using brain actually back to what the levels of IL-6 were during pregnancy. Now these measures, they, these regions, they look like they're, they're <coughs> landing on top of these executive function places. So we can test that, okay? So we can test, well, in, in some of these kids when they get older, we can, we can measure working memory. Now working memory, most people are familiar with. It's a reliable measure that can actually be measured at least by two years of age. 
Um, it predicts lots of emerging skills like theory of mind, social skills, so very highly associated with academics. It's relevant to long-term outcomes, ADHD, um, schizophrenia, autism. Again, like lots of disorders that are highly related to the, the substance use disorder we study. Um, and again, we can measure it at age two phase. So here's just a here's just a quick example of how you can how you measure it. This is just a spin the pots spin the pots measurement, where you have um, you place a bunch of stickers under um, under a lazy susan. You <coughs> you leave two pots empty for the kid. You cover and rotate them, and then the kids get higher scores for if they can find the stickers the faster they can find the stickers. <coughs> it's a measure so they can remember where the empty ones were. Okay. Now. <coughs> The first thing we did for this is we said, well, what are the regions that are involved with working memory? Okay, so you can do, you can use this neurosynth program to do a meta-analysis, 907 studies of all the regions that are heavily involved with working memory. And if our hypothesis is right, and working memory, of course, is, is a very important executive function. If our hypothesis is right, then these regions overlap at least somewhat with the regions that are predicting these maternal IL-6, and in fact, they are. You can, if, if we take, if we take all the regions that fall in within this mask can compare the weights in the model relative to those that fall out. There's heavily significant where um, that these regions are tightly related to this map, this executive function map. Again, this is more specific to working memory, but I think you guys get the idea. So, <clears throat> so here we have regions that seem to be related to working memory. Now, if our model is really, really right, then we should be able to take the maternal inflammation measurements themselves across all these three time points across pregnancy and be able to predict working memory straight forward. Um, and so we've done that, and in fact you can. This is the PLSR model where you can actually, these, there's some, not a ton, but some of the variants of working memory in the kids are age two are related to the inflammatory responses in mom during pregnancy, okay? Which is the final leg of our tree there. And so we know that these development trajectories start well before the onset of disease. We, we, think, we think that maternal inflammation may be one example that relates to newborn brain activity. Um, we've looked at other measures too. Of course, there's a lot of interaction. IL-6 is only one cytokine of like this, a, a whole network of inflammatory markers. Um, but we think that this has, have long, has these kind of maternal pre, prenatal things have long-term consequences with regard to brain development and particularly mental health. Which brings us to the last piece here, okay? We're bridging this stuff across animals, which I'll go through quick. Now, there are a couple of things you should probably consider as we aim to understand potentially, to potentially prevent undesirable outcomes in adolescents, like substance use disorders and other mental health issues, right? One problem is if we're to utilize this information as a potential future target, it should be causal and not epiphenomenal, right? Well, one of the grad students in the lab, Brian Mills, decided to look at this using, using rats. And essentially what he did is you can, you can, you can, you can do surgical procedures of these osmotic pumps in rats, which slowly release IL-6, like you see it chronically over pregnancy, um, um, in, in moms right before they get pregnant, okay? So there's a, we did it on a couple of doses, but the point is, is that we can, we can actually give directly, just give IL-6 to moms while the, during pregnancy in the rodents. Here's the experiment. We we give them IL-6 during pregnancy. Babies the, the babies are born. We wait to their to their get, just get done with weaning. We can do a bunch of behavioral assessments like anxiety and other types of social measures. We can collect the same exact measurements MRI that we do in the humans, and then we can do it again when they get a little older into late adolescence. Um, we collect the MRI, and then we can actually look back and see if using his his immunohistochemistry or other measures to see if our MR measurements are how they're relating to the actual neurobiology. So <coughs> what we see is that the is that during during pregnancy first is that the, the pump works that in moms there's a high that level of IL six during pregnancy is much higher than if you give just a sale if you just give saline with the pump that's the control. And we see some changes in behavior. So there's change. So this is the light dark box. You know where you, you, you essentially are measuring the amount of time the animal stays in the light. If they stay in the dark a long more time, they're more anxious. Um, and what we see is that in the behavior that you can see that at the first time point, the beginning of adolescence, that there that if you've had this IL six, that you're, you are you indeed are you indeed relative to the saline, you indeed are um, 
you're more anxious, you spend more time in the dark, less in the light. You can do things on social behavior, where you, you, this is a, a three chamber choice, where you put the animal here and they can either spend time with their buddy or they can <laughs> spend time over here. You can just measure the amount of time. And again, at the first time point here, again, a lot of these things are going away as they go and move into adulthood, it's something to think about. But in the first time point, in the beginning of adolescence, or that you see that again you see they're much less socially active with the with the with the other with the animal now it's not surprising that many of the brain systems we examine in primates don't exist in rats <laughs> but there is one i mean there are some others like the default network it does exist to be able to show that and we can measure the default system it's probably a subset probably just these green guys down here from the human that exist in rodents but but there's a subset and we can measure that with the actual bold measurements just like we did with the humans and what you can find is indeed if you look at connectivity this is just one circuit where you the il6 animals is the it, it decrease in the default network relative to the sailing animals and i'm i'm again i'm these are, these are short talks i'm this is the findings are are pretty robust to all this the whole system i, I just didn't show i didn't just put the slide so while still very early, we are cautiously optimistic that these data suggest that some of the relationships indeed may be causal in nature, this, 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 these immune responses. We also recognize that IL-6 is just one of a vast inflammatory, like I said, network. Um, and there's lots of other factors that are interacting with the immune response and that we have to consider. In fact, we have been doing that. But this approach is showing some promise for assisting in showing epiphenomenal relationships in our primate models versus those that may be likely more causal in nature. So this is the end, so where are we at? So what does it mean? So do various disorders truly have the distributed deficits across all the brain, right? If we're, to, if we're gonna target regions for treatment, as in the case of many TMS studies, where's the optimal locus, right? If we consider the distribution and development trajectories of various processes in the brain, what's the optimal molecular target to optimize or modify these systems? Okay, so here's the second problem. Where's the lesion? Okay, so if we, in other words, so if we see a pattern of change across development or a distinct pattern related to psychopathology, does that mean that the related biological substrates or pathology is co-located the place that we're seeing on the, our non-invasive brain imaging? Okay, so we have some insights into this now. Um, this is work by David Grayson, who's in the lab, who was a shared student between, with David Amaral and UC Davis where we measured and for, we measured this connectivity signal in four macaques, okay? First thing that we did is that we ran our community detection algorithm on our, our network stuff to see if they, the networks actually resembled what we see in humans, and in fact they do. So here's just a picture of the color-coded systems that we could identify in the macaque. Here's a picture of the color-coded systems in humans across a few of our papers. And as you can see, there's, it's just by the eye test, is that there's, there's lots of correspondence between the monkey networks and human networks. Okay. Now the nice thing about these models is that there are several techniques that allow us to model what we're examining actually with the bold signal, right? So for example, I can take, we have lots and lots of tra axonal tracer data, the actual connectional data on these, on macaques, we can use what's called the COCOMAC database to generate a matrix that's, that's of the structural connectivity in the monkey. And we can take our measures like communicability <coughs> and we can say, do they actually, are these measurements, can we actually model what we're examining with, the, with our bold connectivity, okay? Again, communicability is a way to sum of all the connections between two regions so that it's a full matrix just like the connectivity matrix. Can we predict functional connectivity using the structural links? And the answer is yes. So this is our communicability measurement. This is our functional connectivity in the scanner. And we can, th th these are, um, Minosynaptic connections, polysynaptic connections, and but we can we can indeed model the functional activity signal in the monkey. But if our model is really good, right, then we should be able to take a region out in our model, and we'll see how that model changes the functional activity. And if we take that, if we if we make that same change in vivo in the scanner, then the model should be able to predict the change, right? So that was tested. Again, this is work that was done in the, at UC Davis to get the, to do the, um, the experiment where we use dread receptors where you can selectively inactivate the bilateral amygdalas. Okay, so now we can, 
this here's the experiment. You 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 do the transfections, and then you can, if you as soon as you give C and O, you can you selectively disinhibit the amygdalas, and you can see and you can look to see pre and post change. And the idea is that if we can can our models predict this change, and the answer is it can. So our model is pretty good that you can see the change that we see from the model is actually we can predict it, the change that you see actually empirically in the monkey. Okay, now. The reason why this is all the lead up to this last part, where what's interesting about the change in the functional activity isn't necessarily that the model actually worked, although that's, that's, we think that's really cool, but what, what happens to the system? So here's our bilateral amygdalas. You, deact you deactivate them, and not surprisingly, they start falling off the network. But what's more interesting is kind of what's happening in the systems that are way topologically different. Even though there's no connections even close to the somatomotor system over here, it's changing quite a bit. And in fact, if you, take, if you take a difference map between the two systems, this is the anatomical connectivity, this is the monosynaptic connection. Oh, these are, you can see these are reduced after dreads, and these are actually increased. So what that tells us is that these regions that are close to the monosynaptic connected are decreasing, but there's other changes in the system way distant topologically that are changing as well. Okay? So what, that's, what this is telling us is that, as previous models have suggested, just because we see changes in the system at various locations across the cortex with our non-invasive measurements does not mean that that is a location of the pathology or the change in the biological substrate, okay? If we, we think that if we can prove our models, we might have a procedure that actually can help us zero in on the underlying biology that's causing disruptions um, by actually doing, by looking, by kind of going backwards from the, from the data. But this is still, that's still a little bit in development, although it was in the paper, some aspects of it. So can this information at a given help us predict future outcomes? Can it help us tailor our interventions? Well, it's still a work in progress, but we're continuing to embark on these massive efforts to map the human brain, ABCD study, human connectome project, lifespan, HCP, all this stuff, right? We feel that characterizing heterogeneity, understanding developmental origins, and bridging information across species is going to be really important before we're going to be able to maximize the, the impact of some of these efforts. All right, so I'm going to end there. I'm just going to note that for the we're on track to be releasing the a big chunk of this ABCD data, the first 2,500 subjects very soon. So if people are interested in that, um, you can talk to me or or go to the website. Um, come to Flux Congress. It's going to be in Portland this year. And if you're interested in developmental cognitive neuroscience, um, in September. Um, and thank you.